Hello and welcome to The Extra Mile. I'm Linda Boudreau. Our guests today are Warren Perrin and Kermit Bouillon. They're with the Acadian Museum in Erath, and we're going to find out about that. And uh, I think we're going to have some fun with this today. So thank you both for coming. You're welcome. I'm mostly the only person in Acadiana that hasn't been to the museum in Erath, so this is all new to me. But what is it, and how long has it been there? The museum was founded in 1990. As a result... So it's not that old. No. no okay. No, it's not. It's an old building, one of the oldest buildings in town, the old bank of Erath. And uh, Weldon Granger, who's a native of Erath, now lives in Houston, purchased the building and has uh, allowed our museum foundation to use it for a museum. Okay. And it's just been a joy to see it develop over the years. And how did it come into being? Probably because of the Notoriety, if I could use that word, which developed around my uh, petition, which I filed with the uh, Queen of England and Prime Minister Thatcher in 1990, seeking an apology and an acknowledgement for the wrongs which had been committed against the Acadian people by the British government in the deportation of 1755. It attracted people from all over the world that came uh, to my home and offered to help in this project. Uh, men came from France, they came from Canada, Belgium. A couple of men literally moved into my house, Wilfred <laughs> Doucette and Rene Babineau. And we started just collecting a memorabilia of Acadian history and books, and then people started donating artifacts of the community. And it just sort of developed, and it's totally supported by volunteers from Erath. Wow. So it's kind of, it wasn't really your intention when you started this whole thing to open a museum. It's an outgrowth of other things. And well, I must have been taking a nap when you filed a uh, suit against the Queen of England, but what was that all about? What, what, what made you decide that you wanted an apology? I mean, what was going on with you and with the culture and with the time that you thought it was time to have some redress here? I was getting very interested in my culture and uh, telling a story to my then six-year-old son, Bruce, about the Acadian experience. And when I told him that his uh, ancestor, Beausoleil Broussard, led a guerrilla movement to oppose the British attempt at ethnic cleansing or deportation of the Acadians, and that he had commandeered a British ship, and that he led the first uh, guerrilla warfare campaign in North America. You know, to a six-year-old, he got very wide-eyed and well, said, does that mean way. we're pirates? <laughs> yeah. And of course, it brought home to me the realization that, yes, history still viewed the Acadian people as the French would call malfacteurs or evildoers or people who deserved this inhumane treatment. And at the same time, America apologized to the Japanese-Americans who had been interred in concentration camps during World War II okay. and, and paid each Japanese American $20,000. Those two events really got me to, to study, because I am an attorney, from a legal perspective, if there was a cause of action against the Crown of England. And so I drew up this lawsuit and delivered it. And I'm happy to say they took it very seriously. They retained attorneys in Houston, and that began a 12-year process of negotiations which culminated in December of last year of the signing of the Royal Proclamation by Queen Elizabeth II, where she not only acknowledged the wrongs committed in her name, but also went beyond that and uh, decreed that the July 28th of each year would be set aside for a day of remembrance for the Acadian deportation. Wow. You must be proud. Huh? Very, very That's much That's so. very exciting. So, and this is all the whole, I guess, town of Erath kind of helps to celebrate in, in this particular success, huh? It looks like it's going to be a bigger celebration in Nova Scotia and in Canada than, than in Erath. here. Yeah. Why? Well, they're the ones who are going to enjoy the uh, day of, uh, what is it called? Remembrance. A day of remembrance. It's not an official holiday, but it's a, it's a, a day that they can reflect upon the deportation that occurred in 1755s. Um, uh, the America won't have that day here to celebrate. So, from my standpoint, I think it's a, a bigger event in Canada and Nova Scotia. Because nationally, we're not acknowledging it, whereas nationally they yeah, are. Yeah, right. The United okay. States is okay. not acknowledging this at all. 
Actually, the acknowledgement does not come from Canada. It comes from the Crown, right. represented by right. Queen Elizabeth II right. in her capacity as Queen of the British Empire okay. because the deportation was done in her name. And we are very hopeful, although we haven't gotten confirmation yet, she uh, has been invited when she comes to visit North America next year to read the proclamation at Grand Pré National Historic Site which is the uh, largest Acadian monument in North America. And we very, because she is scheduled to be there in July. And the reason they selected July 28th is of great significance because that's the day the order of deportation was signed in 1755. Okay. Why is it important that the proclamation has been made? We see that world powers still engage in imperialism even today. We see ethnic cleansing going on in Sudan today. We see complaints that even the United States may have abused the rights of prisoners as Abu Ghraib prison exactly. in Iraq. What happened to the Acadians is the quintessential, the first clear example of ethnic cleansing by an imperial power. Britain in North America. And so it was wrong then, it's wrong today. And so Britain and the Queen took the moral high ground in acknowledging these wrongs. And I love to say, as I was interviewed by the BBC of London just last week, that the Queen and the British government are getting as much redemption out of this as the Acadian people are. It sort of puts us back on an even keel where they treated us as subhuman beings, mm -hmm. not worthy of remaining in the British Empire. And now they've said that was wrong. So on a moral basis, we're equal again now with the British. And the British reputation has been enhanced as a country that respects human rights of all people. So this is really a human rights issue and a healing issue. Yes, it is. And it, it doesn't matter if it was 200 years ago, it still has to be corrected. Absolutely. Okay. And it relates to all of the Acadians, all of the Cajuns in South Louisiana. Exactly. I mean, that's where we all came from. Yeah, yeah, because you wouldn't be living here if they hadn't been sent mm -hmm. here. And that's Boudreau, really... Bouillon, Perrin, yeah. Leblanc, Broussard were all descendants exactly. from the deportation. So it really, uh, really affects everybody throughout South Louisiana. It does. It does. Now, does the museum in Erath celebrate? any of the heritage or, or how does that tie in to the whole thing? We're Guys. very proud to say <laughs> that we have the only uh, replica of the Queen's Royal Proclamation in an exhibit at our museum. Which is fitting, if I may say. Yes, it is. Uh, we're very proud of the, the exhibit. It shows the original petition and all of the different uh, events which helped to bring this to fruition. And I must say, when it first started, we here in South Louisiana were viewed as very militant to, to challenge this idea. It could never have come from an Acadian in Canada. It, it had to come from a Cajun, because there they still have very, very strained French-English relations. Of course, here, We've rediscovered our pride through Codafil, through French immersion. We're, we're proud to exclaim it. We have our own Acadian flag. We're, we're sitting in the center of a 22 parish area officially called Acadiana. It's, it's the Acadie of the South. And so we were viewed, and it took us quite a while to gain the support of these Acadians from throughout the world. Because like when Kermit and I went to Quebec about three years ago, uh, the reason we were invited was to make a presentation on the Acadians' efforts to redeem the name through this apology. It's difficult to describe how we saw a change, how they began to accept this, and the whole Acadian community got behind it, and that's what led to it. So this is going to make a bigger difference in other Acadian communities, like in Canada, than it does here, partly because we've already been integrated into the larger society and they have not. Am I hearing that right? Yes, you are. Okay. Uh, as National Geographic magazine wrote when they mentioned this in an article, uh, they said that it, the, Acad the Cajuns of South Louisiana had found their pride. They mm -hmm. had 
they had thrown off the shackles of the deportation. And most Cajuns in South Louisiana don't know this story no. that we're discussing. No. They basically said, we don't care about it. We're just going to go on with our lives and continue to develop our culture and leave. However, those Acadians that remained, that were either able to evade deportation or resettle in other parts of Canada, it's like it was a constant daily burden upon them because they still lived among the people that had tried to deport them. So you would want to be a Boudreaux there. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and I had not realized the effects of not leaving. You know, I never even thought about that as a matter of fact. And what changed all, Linda, was the first World Acadian Reunion in 1994 where yeah. those Acadians in New Brunswick, in Nova Scotia, Cape Breton Island, Prince Edward Island, they decided they were going to declare their independence of the past and had the first celebration. And then we, of course, hosted it in Louisiana in 99, and we're leaving uh, this Saturday to go back to participate in the Third World Acadian Reunion in Nova Scotia. Which is a perfect segue to where we <laughs> wanted to go. You all are, by the time this airs, you will have already been, so you're leaving to go to Nova Scotia, and what's going to be happening? Oh boy, reunions. <laughs> I think a lot of uh, family uh, reunions are going to be taking place that we're going to be attending. Um, I think one of the biggest things um, that's going to take place is that when they have the Broussard family reunion, Warren is going to be one of the main speakers, if not the main speaker that night, um, to explain everything that he's done. And I think people are there are going to really be thankful for him for the um, proclamation from the Queen. It makes a huge difference. I am very impressed. And um, that night, um, there's going to be, um, uh, obviously, there's going to be a lot of food and, and drinks mm -hmm. and uh, music. And we're going to get a chance to visit with a lot of people. Uh, Are these people that you've uh, already met, Kermit, that you're going to be seeing again? I've, I've, I've been to Montreal and Quebec, but I've never been to Nova Scotia. I think Warren's so. been a few times. And um, it, it, it's, it's all exciting. Plus, we're going with a big old congregation from South Louisiana. There's a chance that the mayor of Lafayette may be coming with us. And the governor, maybe? Yeah, yeah I, whoever, I heard that whoever. the governor is considering Let's spread rumors. Coming. Yeah. So it, it'll be a lot of fun. It's going to be great for Louisiana. Plus, that night at the, at the Broussard family reunion, Warren gets to introduce um, his book that he's been working on about Beausoleil Broussard. And as we speak, it's being printed right now. So we can't show you a copy today, but um, hopefully we're going to have um, a proof with us to bring, and then Warren can talk about Beausoleil Broussard. And I was lucky to read the book because um, you know I was involved with Warren um, going to the printer back and forth. It, it sheds an awful lot of light on this guy named Beausoleil, Joseph Beausoleil Broussard, things that we never knew or things perhaps we took for granted. Warren actually dug into old history books and found things and discovered new things, new um, information about this guy. And uh, what we have here is uh, a T-shirt that we had uh, a friend of ours design. And this is, this is a neat image that uh, the artist thought that Beausoleil Broussard would look like and uh, we had T-shirts made, and, and this is the image that's going to be on the book cover. So not only is Warren going to be um, really praised for the Queen's proclamation and the apology, but then now he begins to discuss this guy, Beausoleil Broussard, who was up there in Nova Scotia, was uh, deported just like all of the rest of the Acadians. He came down into St. Martinville area, and he is really the founder of the Broussard clan of South Louisiana. So Warren has a lot of things to do with that, and hopefully his book's going to be a, a, a bestseller. I think it will. Okay. And um, Now, Beausoleil Broussard was, was quite a man, huh? What? He was, and uh, thanks to the help of uh, some of our UL professors like Dr. Carl Brasso and Dr. Barry Ancelet, Ryan Brasher, Dr. Shane Bernard, I was uh, put in contact with a Yale professor. He's head of the history department at Yale, and with their immense financial resources, uh, Dr. John Farragher was able to go back to the original source materials of much of the Acadian history, and he's publishing a book next year in 2005, but he was kind enough to share with me some of his research which he uncovered 
about Beausoleil Broussard. And so with his permission, I'm going to publish for the first time uh, a famous incident where Beausoleil and 86 Acadians were able to dig a tunnel and escape from the British prison and thereby flee to the woods with their families and fight the British in this guerrilla campaign uh, attempting to resist deportation. As a result, many of the Broussards intermarried with the Mi'kmaq Indians. Okay. And in, when the book will be unveiled, we're going to have the representative of the Mi'kmaq Indians of Nova Scotia, Mr. Daniel Paul, join us. And I am um, very interested in that relationship because one of the reasons the Acadians, led by Beausoleil, settled in this region was because they were not afraid to live among the Indians who were then the Atakapa, who were reputed to be man-eaters living in Acadiana at that time. That didn't deter these Acadians because they had just left living with the Mi'kmaq. And in fact, Linda, many of the customs that are attributed to Cajuns, such as an extended family, opening your house, considering the community closeness, it's not a French characteristic. It was picked up more from the Mi'kmaq Indians. And when Beausoleil arrived, he was named the chief. He picked up the title chief of the Acadians and commandant of Les Atacapa territories by the Spanish government. It's a fascinating story, and this book hopefully will tie that history in to the redemption of the Acadian people through, of course, the Royal Proclamation. But so it's all very exciting, and it's all coming full circle. I think so. Now you have another book, okay? The, the Beausoleil book is your second book. What is your first book? I'll let Kermit tell you about that because um, he had a lot to do with it, did uh, much of the artwork and the... Uh, did you really? We, um, I'm a freelance photographer, so um, all of these uh, old pictures you see in here, uh, I ended up um, photocopying them so that we could put into a book. Yeah, yeah a, a couple of neat pictures. Uh, this Just hold is, it straight and still. Yeah. And Michelle and is going to get a good shot. Now, what do we have here, Kermit? This is... Um, this basically is a book about the history of the um, lower Vermilion River territory, uh, anywhere you could say from Lafayette down to the Gulf of Mexico. Okay. Yeah. And it wasn't written by Warren Perrin. It was written by um, General Kearney Dronet. Sometimes I want to call him a colonel, but he's <laughs> a general. And he's, he's a, um, um, a former political figure from the Erath area. And uh, Mr. Dronet never, ever wrote a book before, but Warren started talking to Mr. Dronet and said, you know, we ought to, you ought to do, you're retired. You got nothing else to do. Yeah. <laughs> you and got he time. says, I would, Warren told him I would assist, he would assist in any way possible. He says, you need to do something to document the history of Vermilion Parish, the lower Vermilion River area, how it was founded and who were the leaders and how things came about and, and, and tie it into uh, the history of Erath because at that time it was Erath's um, centennial. centennial. Erath was uh, founded in, I think, 1899, and in 1999 it was 100 years mm -hmm. old. So it was very important that we, um, that Warren felt that some type of book be published. And Mr. Dronet, um, who was not an author at all, did a fantastic job of, of researching, uh, going back into old school board records, into any type of uh, things he could get his hands on. And uh, he put this book together, and the pictures that we accumulated, um, I was involved with because I, re I recopied these photographs. Great old photographs. Th these are all old, old photographs that we recopied, and we put inside the book. And uh, now, you'd be surprised that uh, this is a very important book. You know, people now can go to the library. Uh, children, parents can check out this book and learn more about the history of the Erath area and Vermilion Parish. Mm -hmm. it, it's um, it's like a um, a reference book now. Did you did and you think it would be that when you started this no, project? No, we frankly started out as sort of a picture type book, but uh, General Dronette was taking a writing course at UL. <laughs> See and how so things work out. It huh? segued right into this project, and boy, he complained the whole time how much work he had to do. I know, but it's tough. It, was a, a, it took a couple of years to put it together. And 
But you know, that's a lifetime achievement right there. And we're so proud that our museum is community supported by a uh, hundred volunteers who give of their time. They open, they close, they host visitors on weekends. But what General Dronette did is he went to 15 families that each, each family contributed a thousand dollars to publish 25 copies of the book and donated it to the museum. And today, this is our sole source of financing for our museum. And we've sold all but about 300 copies of the book. Well, after today, it'll be two ninety nine. dollars Mr. Dronet um, donated all the proceeds from the sale of the book to the museum. So in other words, every time we sell a book, Mr. Dronet doesn't make a dime mm -hmm. off of it. And, and, and it's used for us to support the museum, to pay all the expenses and uh, but, of those things necessary to run and operate in the museum. But isn't that what community's about? I mean, and isn't your museum what community's about? And... And, and what the Cajun culture is about it kind of sounds like it all fits to me. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's a funny thing when Warren first approached me, in the, when, eight years ago when we founded the museum, and he said, you know, we're gonna we're gonna make they have this old bank in Erath, and we're, he said, I think we're gonna try and make a museum in Erath. And I knew the first thing I told him is that Warren, you are crazy. Nobody's gonna come to Erath. Why would they come to Erath for a museum? You know, I mean, I'm not being. Uh, ugly, but there's a lot of bars in Erath. People prefer the bars yeah. in Erath than, than at museums. And Warren said, listen, I'd like you to do something for me. So I'd like to have some old pictures of Erath. I'd like you to copy some. And then, you know, I started thinking, I said, well, you know, I have some old pictures um, from my family and even pictures. I was shooting pictures when I was nine years old. I had a little box camera. I said, maybe I could copy some of these old pictures that I shot of Erath. And and we could have the grand opening of the museum. So it, it came to pass, this is exactly what we did, and Warren established the museum. And we were in this big building, probably a little bit bigger than this room here. And I think we had like maybe four pictures on the wall. <laughs> and the whole thing was empty except for four pictures. And Warren was, had some wine and cheese, and, <laughs> and he was pumping everybody. We're gonna have a museum, we're gonna get things in here. And that night, I felt so funny. I said, I, I don't think he can do it. I mean, he's got four or five pictures in here, thanks to me. But the community showed up that night, and ever since then, I think the community has always stayed and showed up. Because now, if you ever visit the Acadian Museum, we have so many photographs that people took from their homes and brought it to the museum and said, Warren, here, I'd rather see this picture in your museum mm -hmm. than in the bedroom back really? here. Really? Stuck in my we have, drawer? We have artifacts. We have antiques. I, I mean, we are now physically, we need a bigger place because uh, the size of the AOC studios, we have wall to wall and on the ceilings, we just have so many artifacts. And it's the community that gave to us. It's mm -hmm. not that... Uh, really, the community gave to itself. Yeah. You know. For a place of safekeeping. Exactly. Yeah, you could say that. Exactly. So we're very proud of everything from what it originally began to where it is today. We got a grant through the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities to help us prepare an exhibit for uh, the centennial celebration in 1999. Dr. Robert Carricker, who's head of the UL History Department, helped us write that grant. And um, with that money, we were able to get professional help and organize our three rooms. One room we have is called the Erath Room, which tells in bilingual displays the history of Erath. Uh, in that particular that room, one of my favorite photographs is of a, a woman from Erath, Miss Shiner, who is pictured in a, an umpire's uniform. She sued Major League Baseball in 1963 for the right to umpire a game. She won in the You gotta watch this people from Erath. <laughs> she was successful. She umpired one major league game. And retired. <laughs> Point made. And she's in Cooperstown Baseball Hall of Fame. <laughs> we have a lot of famous jockeys. Shane Sellis filed a suit to get the right to wear a logo on his saddle when he rode in the Kentucky Derby this year. So we have an exhibit of that also. We have an exhibit of Shane Romero, Shane Sellis, he, and he, Randy he Romero. He sued and won. And won. Well, so, I don't think he had people sue and lose from what I hear. 
That's funny. So there's some very interesting people from ERAT, like Dudley J. LeBlanc. There's a famous man, Nico Broussard, who we're going to have in our uh, forthcoming book called Acadian Redemption. This gentleman got in a buggy with a horse and buggy, and he left ERAT and went to Washington, D.C., with a symbol which was then a rooster of the Democratic Party to present to the President of the United St States to show how a loyal Democrat he was. And our museum has an exhibit on that. We have the map that he used to wow. travel to Washington, D.C. Yeah, we're almost out of time, and, and I, I hate to cut this off, but when is the museum open and people watching want to come and, and see what's there? When can they go? The uh, museum's open every afternoon from 1 to 4, okay. uh, Monday through Friday. And uh, if I can just throw something in Please. real, real, real quick. Please. We have our uh, living legend ceremony. Yes. That, that's very important. We honor people who have contributed to the Acadian culture, to the French language. And, um, and uh, we, we get terrific publicity. The news media shows up. And uh, you usually see it on the 6 o'clock news. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very important that uh, we honor people while they're alive. Mm -hmm. And we induct them into the Order of Living Legends. And it's sponsored solely by the Acadian Museum. And um, it, it's, it's a big thing for us. It's a big thing for these people to be honored while they're still with us. It's a very big thing. And of course, the museum is open whenever we have the Living Legends ceremony, the Saturday afternoons, once a month, it's open. Mm -hmm. okay. And it takes place in our uh, museum cafe, which is next door. And we also have a museum annex, which is a house where we host writers and uh, travelers from other countries who want to visit Louisiana. And, and, so we, and we have great barbecues out there, too. Uh, it's the place to be. You know, <laughs> we're going to have to get you back because there are way too many stories we're not getting to tell today. But I want to thank both of you for being here with us. Uh, we've been talking to Warren Perrin and Kenneth Kermit Bouillon about the, uh, the museum in ERAP. I'm Linda Boudreau, and you've been watching The Extra Mile.